here on our um, Facebook, our first Facebook town live meeting. Um, to all of you who are watching in Cambridge and Massachusetts and anywhere else beyond, I just want to extend my gratitude um, for your joining us and for helping us to keep each other safe today. I know the impacts of the COVID-19, the coronavirus, have affected all of us at our deepest core level. Um, it's also something that while many of us are isolating and physically keeping away from people, has also forced us to come together collectively um, in our ability to try to protect each other and protect ourselves. Um, I wanna say thank you to the group of panelists who I have here with me today. Um, to those watching this, I will moderate and I will um, invite the panelists in just a minute to introduce themselves. We have one hour together today and I wanna use this time to answer as many of your questions as possible. If your question is not answered, please know that we have your email. My staff will do its best to follow up with you. You can also, um, if you know about this because you've been receiving my updates every day, every evening we send out an update that is filled with both Cambridge and statewide updates um, and what we are doing to try to keep us all safer um, and to, to get through this together. Um, at this time, I have an extraordinary panel, uh, panelist, uh, group of panelists that um, touch on the issues of behavioral health our healthcare, our public safety, employment law, and um, people with experience who work on issues around homelessness and, and, and housing. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask each of you to just spend a, a couple of seconds, if you could, in just introducing yourself. Um, I will start with um, Dr. Assad Sayah, who has been extraordinary leading the Cambridge Health Alliance um, as its CEO, but prior to that has spent many years really preparing, I think, his entire professional career for leading us through this um, as best we can. Uh, thank you, Representative Decker, and thank you for putting us together in here today and for all the work that you're doing for the community at large uh, and for healthcare in specific. Uh, my name is Assad Seya. I am uh, the uh, CEO for the Cambridge Health Alliance and the Commissioner of Public Health for the City of Cambridge. Uh, I am an emergency physician by training and uh, have been practicing in emergency medicine for over 30 years. Uh, and my background is in disaster preparedness. So this is work that we've been doing for the last uh, 30 years plus uh, moving throughout the disasters. But I can tell you, even with 30 years experience, I have not been through, uh, through an event like this. So we're all learning today. Thank you, Dr. Saya. Um, I would like to ask at this point, uh, Kelly Turley, um, the director of the Mass Coalition for the Homeless, to please introduce herself. Oh, actually, I think Kelly is about to join us. I will quickly turn to Donna Mausch, who's president and CEO of the Massachusetts Association for Mental Health. Thank you, Representative, for having me today. I am with the Massachusetts Association for Mental Health, or a statewide public policy and legislative advocacy organization that works uh, to advance access to care for people who need treatment, but also to promote mental health and well-being in the Commonwealth. I've spent over 40 years working in this field. Uh, I've had jobs ranging from working in the state hospital, uh, to the community, to running different agencies. I served as state director of mental health for the state of Rhode Island and ran the divisions of mental health substance abuse and forensic medicine here in Massachusetts years back. And uh, I'm very glad to be joining you today. Thank you. Um, I'd like to also welcome um, Cambridge Commissioner Branville Bard, who also brings extraordinary experience and um, couldn't be happier and more grateful that he is with us here now in Cambridge. Hi, everyone. My name is Branville Bard. I'm the police commissioner for the city of Cambridge. Um, I've got about 28 years of experience, most of that experience uh, coming up through the ranks of the Philadelphia Police Department, where I left as an inspector and I was the chief of police for the Philadelphia Housing Authority for a couple of years before taking this post, and I'm nearly three years in this in here uh, in the city of Cambridge. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'd like to introduce um, a, a longtime friend and advocate who I've known as well, uh, Monica Hallis, who's joining us from Greater Boston Legal Services. So sorry. Um, hi, Monica. Hi. Thank you so much, Representative Decker. Um, I'm a member of the huge Representative Decker fan club, 
And um, with my other head on, I'm a consulting attorney at Greater Boston Legal Services. We provide free civil legal services to about a third of the state, including Cambridge, in a wide variety of areas, including housing, immigration, welfare, family. Um, and um, in particular, I'm in the employment unit. We also have a CORI unit. And my particular area is unemployment law, so happy to answer any questions about that. Thank you, Monica. Uh, and I believe soon we will be joined by Kelly Turley um, as well and um, from the Mass Coalition for the Homeless. I also want to say a really special thank you to, um, to Susan, Sean, and Hong, and everybody at CCTV who is working to make sure that um, we can be connected at a time where it's more important than ever. So at this time, I will take um, the first question. So um, I guess one of the questions I have is, um, well, I think this is well, healthcare. Um, is there enough testing capacity right now to test everyone showing COVID-19 symptoms? Dr. Sayer? That's a great question. And uh, thank you for asking the question. <clears throat> uh, today, if you look at the testing algorithms uh, throughout the region and probably more nationally, uh, Historically, we were testing anybody that says, I need to be tested. And as the demand grows and the supply is limited, basically we are triaging patients and, and uh, uh, citizens for the people that really need to be tested. And uh, the way we're doing that is through a quick triage algorithm where somebody would call and based on their risk factors and uh, health condition and the symptoms, uh, they will be asked either to stay home if they're healthy and they have minimum symptoms and they don't need to be tested. So by virtue of this, we're not testing most people. And that's the right thing to do from a clinical point of view. Or if they, uh, if they need to be tested and they're healthy enough that they don't require an evaluation, they are being tested. And that's pretty standard right now. We started this as the first uh, organization to test in the region. Uh, if they require an evaluation and they're not very sick, they're uh, sent to an area where they are evaluated and treated. And if they're sick, they're uh, immediately asked either to call 911 or, or go to the nearest emergency department for an evaluation and treatment. So that's the long answer. The short answer is if we follow this algorithm, we have enough tests. I'm Don Mosh. Um, if you are currently seeking treatment for opioid use and disorder, um, what are we doing so people can continue their treatment? So uh, there are several things being done. Uh, the first is that uh, the governor uh, and Mass Health lifted all restrictions uh, and have really eliminated a number of barriers to the use of remote care or telephonic care so that people can be in touch directly with their physicians and other treaters. If they're trying to get medication assisted treatment to go along with counseling, uh, they, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration has also lifted rules that would have required in-person treatment and has expanded the uh, panels that are available so that physicians can more readily prescribe uh, these life-saving drugs for people uh, who need them. The division of BSAS, the, the Bureau of Substance and Addiction Services in Massachusetts, they have also been making changes in the administration of methadone in the Commonwealth to enable people to take home uh, dosages and not have to be out daily uh, waiting in lines, picking up dosages and other uh, things like that. And if people need more information, I'd be happy to get that to them. Thank you, Donna. And I know that you and I and a number of others continue to work on this issue as well. We do representative. Be... For those yeah. who don't know, I'm this called representative chairs, the Mental Health Substance Use and Recovery Committee in the legislature. And we work as a community under her leadership to address these issues. Yep. And, and we are meeting several times throughout the week to continue this. Um, I guess there's a question here that I will ask first Commissioner Bard to answer, and then uh, Kelly Turley could also take an answer. So first, the question is, when will the, um, the emergency homeless shelter in Cambridge open up in Cambridge, and 
who will it serve? So maybe both you, Commissioner, and Dr. Saya can respond to that with a follow-up question will be, what are we doing to ensure that individuals who are experiencing homeless throughout the state are, uh, state are also going to get the care that they need? Commissioner? Uh, thanks, Representative Decker. So we expect that the shelter will be, as op will be open as early as next week, um, in the uh, next few days, as early as next week. It'll serve three distinct populations, and I'll let uh, Dr. Asaya uh, elaborate, but it'll serve those needing quarantine space, those need an isolation space, and then it'll serve as a, a general shelter with uh, sleeping capacity and daytime uh, services programming available for a um, hundred or so uh, individuals. So those three unique spaces. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And uh, uh, just to elaborate briefly, uh, we all know that the needs uh, are, uh, are different for all three populations. And, and uh, the idea in here is not to mix all three populations because we don't want to we don't want to make the healthy sick and the sick sicker and the unknown either mixed with the healthy or with the sick. And uh, this is the same uh, protocol that we follow for clinically in the hospital and out in the community. And our homeless are just as important as everybody else. And we want to make sure that we provide them with the same services at the same level with the same care. Uh, that's provided to everybody else. And by virtue of this, we've been, we are fortunate at the city of Cambridge to have the support and the resources and the alignment among all stakeholders to be able to create an environment that is conducive to providing care at that level. Uh, and, and as commissioner said, uh, we do have an area for the people, for the folks that are quarantined until such time we, uh, we know for with a high level of certainty, whether they are positive or negative, and if they're COVID positive, obviously, if they don't need hospitalization, uh, they will join the other COVID positive uh, that are in, in their own area. Uh, and if they're negative, they go back to the general population. But uh, that area, I just want to emphasize uh, that uh, we are not providing clinical care in that area. If patients are sick, they are transported to the hospital and that we're caring for them at the hospital like everybody else. Thank you. Kelly, what is it looking like at the state level? Thanks for having me. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Okay. Um, so we know that there are municipal efforts going on in several communities around the state, but honestly, we're lacking a sense of urgency, it seems, at the state level to really create rapidly enough spaces for people to isolate, quarantine, and to practice social distancing. Um, there have been efforts to create those spaces for unaccompanied adults in some cities, but we really haven't heard anything from state officials in the Baker administration around how we're going to bring these resources online into scale for families with children experiencing homelessness and unaccompanied youth. Uh, we have been trying to engage in conversations with the Department of Housing and Community Development that oversees um, the shelter system and others. Um, and not that they're not working on it, but we haven't seen any progress. We know that just until a few years ago, the state had almost 2000 families staying in hotels and motels that were being used as overflow spaces when the shelter capacity was full. Right now, there are only about 13 families statewide that are in hotels that are being used for um, shelter. And we need to bring that type of capacity online right now so that families who are in shelters, over 3,500 families in shelter now, aren't in overcrowded congregate situations where once the virus is introduced, um, it could be spread. And you know we fear that it's already spreading now. Um, so we really feel that there is a sense of urgency and we want to see the state take more concrete action instead of waiting for um, families and individuals to um, contract COVID-19. Thank you, Kelly. I know that I was on a call last week with Secretary Sutters, um, who is now leading the Command Incident Center for the governor and um, who also comes from uh, as our Secretary of Health and Human Services, who is uh, who acknowledged that they're working on this issue and they're working on a state plan. Um, and I know that they are individually reaching out when they get a call from a shelter around the state. What we still need is DHC to, to really meet the urgency of this and, and have a plan that is more transparent and shows communities how they quickly can do what communities like Cambridge and Boston are doing. Thank you for all your leadership. Um, 
I also, at, at this point, I'd like to ask, we have a, a question here that if you're an independent contractor, um, are you eligible for unemployment um, insurance? Because if you go to the state website, it currently says you're not eligible. Monica? Wait, Monica, we can't hear you. Um, Monica, we can't hear you. Do we need to come back to Monica? Um, okay. Monica, we can't hear you, but I think they're gonna they're we're, they're gonna work on that. So we're gonna come back to you. Um, I would say um, another question is our um, how how are we continuing behavioral health services um, to, pe to people who need them and making them more accessible when so much of our behavioral health care does not include social distancing? It's sort of the antithesis of that. Um, Donna, can you maybe give us a range of what families are doing and and also a range of what the different kinds of behavioral health needs that people um, are, are needing and, and different approaches? I can. To yes. Well, you know, this is a time of great uncertainty and people are experiencing tremendous stress. And I just want to acknowledge that even for people who didn't have an identifiable condition before this, there are people who are experiencing anxiety and some because of social isolation and loneliness, uh, depression. Um, and other other risks. And there are services and supports available uh, to people, uh, informational things. Increasingly, providers are taking services online and posting information. Massachusetts launched something called Network of Care Massachusetts 10 days ago that provides online access to information about more than 5,000 different uh, behavioral health and related social services in the Commonwealth, as well as a 30,000 item library that people can access if they want to learn more about these conditions. For people who are already have these conditions and are in treatment, things have changed on the ground because of social distancing. And people are more dependent now on being able uh, to talk to their clinicians by telephone. Uh, the good news is that, as I said earlier, the changes in the regulations and the executive orders allow payment for services that are delivered by telephone, not just on a web type platform that we're using today or a secure audio visual platform. And it removes barriers for prior authorization of those services. Um, there are provisions for writing emergency prescriptions for people who may be worried about running out of their medication. And uh, through your primary care practitioner, or your specialty practitioner, whether that be an addiction medicine specialist or a psychiatrist. Uh, we're also working to increase that workforce. Uh, the legislature is working and the uh, governor's office is working to change practice regulations so more people can participate in providing this care. Physicians who'd retired, for example, could come back into practice easily. Uh, nurses could practice at what people call the top of their license. So um, now that said, we have a lot of people who are in congregate care, people who live in group living environments uh, where they have staff supports around them, uh, people who are among uh, the homeless population who have mental health and substance use conditions. And for them, they're not often living in situations where they can socially distance easily. And that's why it's so important that people are taking steps. Community residence providers, for example, like VINFEN here in Cambridge, are working to uh, establish sites where they have staff around the clock uh, and are enabling people to spread out a bit more. They've canceled a lot of the day type programming that involves people congregating in close proximity to one another and are trying to substitute smaller groups and online supports and telephonic assistance to people. But I think we're still trying to figure this out to some degree. 
and we're fortunate to have leaders who have really good values and intentions and are working hard to, to solve these things, whether that's at the community level or among the providers or at the state level. And uh, I think we all need to join together to try to devise solutions, um, particularly for people who might be in a secure setting like a psychiatric hospital. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Donna. Monica, do you wanna to try to answer the question again? Yes. Can you hear thank me you. now? Yes. Great. So uh, thank you for that question. Yes, they're um, currently under state law, independent contractors are not eligible. But the federal law that President Trump signed on March 27th, the CARES Act, creates a whole new program of eligibility for independent contractors, self-employed, people who haven't worked enough or earned enough to qualify for unemployment benefits. Uh, the state is waiting from, for technical guidance from the Federal Department of Labor. That's why the program has not started yet. But when it does start, it'll be available to anybody in those new categories who has been unemployed because of the COVID virus. It's retroactive back until January. The benefits are based on a complicated formula, anywhere from over th um, $300 to um, $800 plus between the dates of 327 and 721, an extra $600 per week. And the and, uh, eligibility lasts for 39 weeks. The next question I have is that uh, people are concerned about um, who is identified as an essential worker in Cambridge and the question seems to be particularly focused on people who are doing food and delivery businesses. Are they getting the training that they need to, to do this safely? And are they being, um, do they have access to the PPE? We all know PPE. Four weeks ago, this was not in my vernacular. Um, but the first for their, uh, the, the, the equipment they need to keep themselves safe and keep others safe. How are they getting access to that? And who's ensuring that proper, um, that public health protocol is being informed at the grocery stores and at, um, when people are delivering stuff out in the neighborhoods? Dr. Syed, do you want to try to take that one? I'm happy to try to take it on. I, I, to be honest with you, um, I really have no idea how much they are trained, uh, the, the food delivery services. And, um, uh, and the, the training is very simple, uh, is to make sure that social distancing uh, is taking place and there is no contamination that's transmitted between them and the people that are receiving the food whether it is through the surface of the food or through proximity. Um, this is a challenge across the board. And uh, the challenge um, has some simple answers, but no defined answer that apply across the board. Uh, and people have to use common sense uh, when, when this happens. Uh, the best thing in my, uh, in my opinion to do is the person receiving the food should be taking most of the precaution in here. Uh, and uh, the, the, the food itself should be fine as long as it's handled appropriately. Usually what one needs to do is to make sure that the packaging is handled appropriately and, uh, and that you're not exposing your whole house to whatever packaging you're receiving. Uh, yeah, ideally, um, you know, try to cook your food yourself. Uh, that's, that's best uh, because that's the best way to make sure that the food is prepared appropriately. And we all know that heat kills the virus. So if you cook the food, uh, the food is not contaminated with virus. And just, I think, you know, we had a conversation early on about this when I called you, as, as you know, my mother is a senior and she has COPD. So I've been for probably three and a half weeks really concerned about her and, and others just like her who are who seemingly are additional vulnerable, but we now know that actually we're all vulnerable. Um, and one of the things that you reminded me to do was to, when I can, I write down the, so when we get food coming in, I write down if you have um, hot water and soap, um, if you don't have access to any kind of disinfectant, which many of us don't, hot water and soap, scrub the packaging if you can. It's hard for cardboard, um, but, and, and when you touch it, um, if it's cardboard eggs or cereal, go wash your hands before Absolutely. you eat. Um, and I think people want to know more about that and, and, and people are scared. Absolutely. Um, uh, I would ask, uh, Commissioner, people are wanting to know more about um, 
what are we doing to see? I, I think we've all seen pictures around the state of walkers and joggers who are not keeping really six feet apart. And it's also hard for people who are on sidewalks who are passing. I still think we're learning how to choreograph what physical distancing is and, and whose responsibility it is to move. Um, I, I, I know personally we just move. Um, but could you speak to, is there anything happening specifically in Cambridge to do that? And, and are you hearing from your colleagues around the state around um, how to help? And this is, a, I know this is a tricky issue for enforcement as well. It's not just a law enforcement, police, public safety issue, it's a public health issue, but. So just to back up to your last question, in the city of Cambridge, through the city manager's office, our inspectional service uh, department is responsible to go out to the restaurants and ensure that standards are being upheld and social distance practices are maintained. Now, as far as it um, pertains to social distance in the community, um, like you alluded to, Representative, it, it is a public health emergency and not a public safety emergency. And so we're trying not to turn it into that. Um, but with that being said, um, we have, through our Department of Public Works, um, printed up signs in several different languages um, reminding individuals of the need to social distance. Um, we are assisting at the department, the police department is assisting by going to uh, all of our green spaces and our parks and reminding individuals of the need to uh, the social distance and principles. So once again, we're trying not to turn it into a public safety uh, issue and just reminding everyone of the public health benefits of social distancing. So far, folks are taking that gentle nudge and we're, we're, we've been fine and haven't had any protracted issues. Thank you. Um, yeah, just, just a reminder for people, if you see somebody move if you can, um, especially if you think it's harder for them. Um, so when I divert my eyes, I'm just trying to read the questions as they come through. Um, Monica, this seems to be a question for you. The governor has mentioned that there's a 60 and 90 day period that renters and mortgage holders will have to remedy delinquent bills after housing courts reopen. Um, but that doesn't help people who are barely getting by or on UI or under or other um, benefits. With the state, will the state invest in assistance that ensures tenants, landlords, ma mortgage holders, and banks are made whole financially? This is probably a question for both of us, but you, you can start, Monica. And, and what policies do you think people should be advocating for? So I'm afraid I'm going to have to get back to you on that. I am not um, a housing lawyer. Um, and um, I know that there's an effort to have a much more expanded piece of legislation that has currently come out of the Senate to deal with those kind of issues. But I'd have to get back to you to um, supply the correct answer. Yeah, I mean, I would say that I was, I've was i been talking to uh, the House Chair, Kevin Honan, who has um, filed a bill to address some of this as well. And he has been concerned that people, um, not wanting people to experience increases in their rent and certainly not to, and I've heard people, even officials say, oh, well, there's no evictions in Massachusetts right now. And to be clear, yes, there are. People can still file an eviction for you. What they can't do is go to court and follow through. So really, the reason why we need this by either executive order or a legislative order is so that people actually can't file um, evictions so that will hurt people once the courts actually open up again. But there's certainly more that we need to do. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that, Kelly. Sure, thank you. And um, I was asked to also introduce myself. Um, my name is Kelly Turley. I'm the Associate Director of the Massachusetts Coalition for the Homeless. We do statewide direct service and advocacy work. And one of the programs that we helped to start back in 2005 and continue to um, help grow with the leadership of Rep Decker is a program called Residential Assistance for Families in Transition, RAFT. And that's a program that currently provides funds for households to pay for back rent, back utility bills, startup costs to move into a new apartment. And we've been working to try to expand that program right now, given the current pandemic. Um, mass housing has contributed an extra $5 million into a specific fund to, house, to help households impacted by COVID-19 economic downturn or physical health issues. Um, but we really know that we're going to need a much bigger investment than that to make sure that tenants can continue to pay their rent and that um, low income homeowners can pay their mortgages. And so we're asking the legislature to invest $50 million in new funding in the RAFT program. Um, it may not come all at once, but making sure that 
if there are continued eviction and foreclosure moratoria, that there are funds on the other side to help people pay back what's um, what's due. Thank you, Kelly. Um, a couple of other questions that have come through right now. Um, you know, I, I have somebody asking um, if landscapers and gardeners could be considered as essential as it's planting time. I guess that I'll I'll respond and just to say that I think what's important right now with this shelter in place advisory um, is that um, we're really trying to keep people off the streets. And so I've had conversations with people in our own community who are in this field. And if there's a tree that poses a public safety um, issue, I know that an arborist can come out and address that right now. But um, as long as we are in this state and, and just to remind people and, and Dr. Sayad, maybe you want to chime in on this. I think that these last two to three weeks have been really challenging on people. Um, not because two or three weeks feels like an impossible amount of time to stay home, but because we don't know what the unforeseeable future is. And I think before we start talking about releasing and opening up um, who might be considered essential, to remind people um, in, in a very pragmatic way, we, we have not entered the eye of the storm yet. Um, and so right now is not the time to allow more people to, to become part of the essential staff if they're not about helping to keep people alive. Maybe you want to add to that. Absolutely. And, and uh, a lot of, uh, if you go down the list, uh, there are a lot of people that could be considered uh, uh, important. Uh, but the, uh, uh, the criteria for somebody to be considered essential is, are these services absolutely uh, critical for the continuity and the supply for people that can, and, and making them make sure that they're fed and they can get transportation and the absolute essentials as they are being asked to stay home. Uh, and you could ask, you could add a lot of exceptions to the list. Unfortunately, uh, it's hard to do. And the shorter that list is, the better we are. We want to make sure that the probability of people uh, being close to each other is minimized because this is one way of transmitting this virus. And the more we can practice social distancing, uh, the, the higher the likelihood that we can get the situation under control. I mean, there are two ways for this to eventually that's going to go away. Either a whole lot of people are going to be infected and a whole lot of people will be immune and a whole lot of people will die. Or much fewer people can be infected and we can get this virus, this, this under control by social distancing so it's not transmitted from one person to another and we can get over this. And the choice is hard. We can go choice number one and have everybody go about their business, but that's a difficult choice. And if we go in that direction, remember, there's going to be thousands of people that will be sick all at the same time and require all care at the same time. And we have no capability and capacity in the healthcare environment to care for all these people at the same time. I just hope that we never get to a point where we have to practice rationing because we have no ability to care for everybody at the same time. So I implore everybody for that purpose to help us, to help us manage this absolutely unprecedented situation by practicing social distancing and help us manage this situation through option two, not through, you know, everybody gets infected. Yeah, and I, and I think your point is really also important to not overlook. Um, this is about keeping us safe, but quite honestly, it's also about keeping our um, our frontline healthcare workers safe um, and trying to really slow that surge. And just the, I think for me, one of my takeaways will forever be the fact that our hospital has asked community members and given them the pattern to make masks. Like that, that's exactly, that is where we're at. And um, hopefully that will continue to change and, and people will get the PPE they need. But this is also about really not overwhelming our health care system at once. Thank you. Monica, did you want to chime in here? I just want to, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I just wanted to add that a source of income for all these folks, I spoke about the new federal program, but the state unemployment insurance program has greatly expanded in terms of responding to the COVID-19 crisis so that if you reasonably believe that your health is going to be compromised or you have to stay home to care for a child because school is closed 
or any other reason that you are not working because of COVID-19, you're eligible for unemployment benefits, including if you're just working part-time, you may be eligible for partial benefits. So I would encourage folks to apply now because we also have this limited opportunity for folks to get an extra $600 a week while on unemployment benefits. Thank you, Monica. Uh, another question has come up. Um, it's so they, they talked about the um, the CHA website says if you're feeling symptoms, you should contact your primary care doctor. And this is an issue that's come up in conversations I've had across the state. Not everybody has a primary care doctor. So who do they reach out to if they don't have a primary care doctor but are concerned about having symptoms? It's, a, uh, it's a, also a very good question. Uh, you can call the main line uh, of the hospital, uh, 617-665-1000 and you'll be transferred uh, to our uh, nurse triage program. It's not only there for our own patients, but for also for the community. And also you can call our doctor's finder program and they will transfer you. It's all on our, on our website. Um, we are not turning people away. And one of our question is not, uh, are you one of our patients? The only time that uh, uh, we are limiting uh, to our patient is the testing site uh, because uh, for two reasons. One is we have a limited capacity in there. We can't open it to the whole community. To the whole community, and two, our patients uh, already have an electronic medical record, which is very important to identify the patient when they show up to the drive-through testing site and make sure they get the right test and we know who they are and we can get back to them uh, on the back end. Um, you know, a few days later when we get the test results. Uh, that's that's the only place where we limit. Uh, the conversation to our own patients. But regarding the uh, the, the triage or the emergency department, uh, um, there's enough information uh, and we're happy to provide any information to anybody in the community. Thank you. Uh, well, another question that has come through, is there any centralizing of resources for vulnerable populations throughout the state, including where to access food, um, internet, um, clothing, or other essential needs, um, or is this being left up to municipalities? Um, Kelly, do you want to chime in? Sure. So a lot of groups are trying to compile lists and information, including the Massachusetts Coalition for the Homeless. Um, the state is recommending that people call Mass 211, which is a, um, a hotline. There are staff from the Department of Public Health taking questions that are specific around COVID-19, but also um, the questions around access to needed resources. Where are there food pantries? Where can I, how do I access unemployment benefits? How do I access shelter? And so Mass 211, people can just dial 211 on their phone and um, access the staff there. Um, but at the same time, knowing that there, are, if people have specific requests, um, there may be advocacy groups and nonprofit organizations that also can help point them in the right direction, um, including advocates at the coalition. Thank you. And I think that um, for those of watching who aren't in Cambridge, um, you know, I would also encourage you to contact your state representative. I think many of my colleagues have um, a list of resources and are trying to push those out as well. And I would say there's a lot of um, emerging neighborhood aid societies that are popping up throughout communities in Massachusetts where neighbors really are working to take care of each other in support and in partnership with government. Uh, another question has come up. Um, Don, I think this one's for you. So what kind of support is for people who are moving out of sober homes back into their, um, into their, to their own home and community? Well, I think right now the main supports are online recovery support groups, uh, more, the Massachusetts Organization for Addiction and Recovery is posting uh, a number of things uh, that are available as people increasingly try to have recovery support groups operate telephonically and also through Zoom and things like that. Um, at the Network of Care website, you can also access online resources. So that's if you Google Massachusetts Network of Care, I'm sorry, Network of Care Massachusetts, you can get to that site and search that by uh, service type, uh, by your zip code and distance from your zip code. Although frankly, online services are don't require a zip code, but um, yeah, uh, state, uh, Department of Public Health is also uh, developing information. If you call the Substance Use Helpline, 
uh, you can also get information. Someone picks that phone up uh, weekdays uh, during business hours. Uh, it was designed to give people information about access to residential treatment and inpatient treatment, but they've also got information for accessing the broader array of services. I would just add that if people are also looking for resources, Donna just listed off a whole bunch, but also um, we are also happy to respond to you individually. We have your email, you can email us, and we are collecting resources, not just for Cambridge, but in my capacity as a chair in the house for the whole state, and we've been pushing out those resources. Um, and when it comes to those who are in recovery, I can just say, I, I feel like this moment is made for us to look to many people in recovery who for um, many decades have had to actually be their best advocates and learn how to um, create opportunities for self-care and community um, when they weren't getting a lot of support. So I've been really inspired um, and amazed in this work as I've gotten to know this community better and now more than ever. Um, I, Monica, someone is saying, what happens if they are having trouble getting through to unemployment, if they're applying and they can't get through? Have you been hearing about this? Oh, yes. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's a huge problem right now because the system is under considerable strain with the thousands of people applying, applying on UI on, online, then having problems with UI online and having to call. There is right on the first page of the unemployment agency website, which is mass.gov slash DUA for Department of Unemployment Assistance, a form you can fill out with the particular problem you're having getting through and you will get a call back. In addition, I wanted to add that legal services around the state is compiling information on every program such as food stamps, unemployment, health, et cetera. And you can access that very easily on mass help, mass legal help, excuse me, dot org. Thank you, Monica. Commissioner, if people call 211, are the operators also able to connect people for emergency medical needs? Um, in any emergency situation, I would ask individuals to call 911. It's the quickest, safest, fastest way that we'll be able to get you help. Um, obviously, from any one of our, if you, any of the calls that come into our emergency communication center can be redirected through 911. But the best way is to always call 911. And we do have text the 911 now capabilities here in Cambridge. So, um, but the quickest way is always just to go straight to 911. Thank you. Um, Kelly, if somebody receives a rent increase right now um, or is being told that they need to sign a, um, a, a renewal lease with a, with a significant rent increase, what is your advice for them right now? I'm sure you're getting these calls as we are. Right. So we're waiting for the state to enact statewide regulations and prohibitions on these types of rent increases. Um, but in the face of that, encourage people to reach out to groups like the Coalition for the Homeless, housing advocacy groups, legal services to make sure that they're if at all possibly be paired with an advocate. Oftentimes, um, landlords may not um, carry out the same actions if they know somebody else is backing up the tenant. And so wanting to provide that additional accompaniment and support for them at this time. Um, but hopefully there will be statewide action to prohibit um, these unconscionable rent increases during a pandemic. Thank you. I'm getting a question from somebody right now asking how they can continue helping making masks for the Cambridge Health Alliance. Um, I, I just say we will send, we have a pattern. Um, and Dr. Sayed, can you also be clear that these are not masks that are being used by doctors? Because I think there's been some confusion about why are we being asked to make masks, who's using them, um, and if they're not an N95 um, material. Uh, yes, and uh, the barrier is very important across the board. We're not using those fabric masks when we perform surgery and, and when we perform procedure on patients. Um, but there are opportunities to, to provide those masks for our employees that, that are, that have less patient facing uh, opportunities. There's a lot of people that have worked in, in maintenance, housekeeping, uh, et cetera, that are uh, absolutely critical to the functioning of the organization and the care that we provide to our patients. Uh, but they're not providing uh, procedures or direct care or, or touching the patient directly. We need to protect our folks. And uh, this is one way to make sure that our folks remain healthy. 
Thank you. We have the pattern and we will send it out again to those who um, want us to. The next question looks like it's for me. So can I share any insights to what the budget process looks like in the House of Representatives in the legislature? Um, I, I can share a little bit. I was just on the call with um, Speaker DeLeo and my colleagues yesterday and Chairman Aaron Mikowitz, and we are continuing to, um, Chairman um, Aaron Mikowitz is continuing to take meetings with legislators and we are going over our budget priorities. Um, I will tell you, there, there, the question is, what can we do, what would you suggest to people who want to advocate on non-COVID-19 issues? Um, I'm just going to be really honest that that's hard. Um, people should continue to advocate on any issue they care deeply about. The, the hope here is that our life will go on um, once we um, really weather through this storm. Um, we don't know what that looks like. I don't think any of us know what that looks like right now. And um, our, all of our attention, my attention, I can tell you, is through the lenses of COVID-19. Um, there's a number of pieces of legislation that I care deeply about that I'm keeping my eyes on. So I'm watching to make sure that they're not, um, I'm not missing any of the deadlines where they're still sitting in committee. And uh, we've been able to get some extensions on some of those deadlines. But um, the budget is going, we, we are, we are going to be billions um, behind <laughs> for what we need. Um, that, that number is, is continuing to be looked at because we actually haven't, um, we, we don't know what that number looks like right now. I, I, I will just say that. Um, we're making projections, but because we still don't know what the total impact um, and the devastation of loss of life and the effort to save life and the, and all the impacts that are um, financial, emotional, um, our security and in, in, in the ways that we've never ever, um, the way many of us, many people's security has every day been threatened this way. But collectively as a society, um, our, our overall well-being and security is, um, is being undermined and we just don't know what rebuilding and recovery is going to look like. So I will tell you that the House is continuing to do its work and looking at the budget and trying to do that balance of things that were on our radar before this pandemic and, um, but being also being realistic and trying to address the needs right now of what the pandemic is requiring for us to, to save lives and to save those who are saving lives. So reach out to me. Um, just know that if you're reaching out to me that um, COVID-19 issues are the ones that right now are at the top of my radar. And um, I now seem to have 15 hours a day to do work um, before, <laughs> which I, I didn't really have that many hours before COVID-19, like many of you. So um, my team is, we're, we're doing our best to, to manage all that, but continue to engage with your legislator on anything that's important to you. Uh, let's see, some of the other questions here. Um, so, um, I wanted to remind people that there is, um, uh, for me and, and my committee, I just started a, a subcommittee on um, looking at the issue of domestic violence through the issues of behavioral health. I have that going for uh, children's behavioral health as well as looking at um, behavioral health as it impacts immigrants. Um, but the issue of how um, people who are ready to uh, leave a, um, an abusive relationship, where do they go um, when social distancing and physical distancing is required. Um, how do you connect with help um, if you are experiencing abuse? And uh, I wanna make sure that for people around, and it's not just Cambridge, Transition House serves um, lots of communities well beyond Cambridge, but the hotline, which we will make sure is also posted, um, which is uh, operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week, locally is 617-661-7203, 7203. Um, and um, just just before this call, we were emailing a group of us who are forming the subcommittee to look at what other countries have been doing um, to address the issue of domestic violence in the pandemic. And I know we have statewide coalitions um, that are also meeting and talking about this. Commissioner Barr, is there anything specific that you're seeing around the issue of domestic violence um, that you would want to comment on now as well? Yeah, well, we, we are preparing for the likelihood that we'll see calls of domestic violence nature increase. Um, so we're, we have heightened awareness for that. Our domestic uh, violence response teams are remaining vigilant, making sure that they follow up on uh, any call that may have a domestic violence, violence nexus so that we can uh, put those individuals in contact with uh, the resources of the region. Um, we understand that individuals may in fact be trapped with their abusers because of uh, this quarantine, isolation, self, uh, you know, shelter in place uh, order uh, advisory. And so we're being hyper vigilant and sensitive to uh, any call that has a potential nexus to domestic violence. 
Um, I, you know, I know an important piece right now that there are some organizations, um, Casa Marina, I know, is doing incredible work right now, as well as others, on trying to identify quickly communities where they can identify fully furnished um, apartments so that if somebody has the opportunity to leave their abuser, that a shelter in place order is not going to be the obstacle to doing that. And um, I'll, I'll just say to the question, the person who asked that question, one of the things I charged my colleagues who are on the subcommittee with me under the Behavioral Health Task Force is to say, part of our job is to help empower our colleagues throughout the legislature to start looking at how local communities are doing it and, and our local communities um, empowered with enough resources to meet those needs. Um, and so we will be talking more about that as well. And um, just to thank you. Uh, another question that just came up is, what's being done to provide um, mental health support for uh, first responders and healthcare professionals? I, I think uh, Dr. Sayre, uh, Donna Mausch, and then Commissioner Bard all could probably chime in on this. And we have uh, 10 minutes. So I will say if we could do the three of you in, in less than four minutes, that would be great. Um, I, I, this is a great question. And right now we're in, in, the, in the midst of, uh, of a difficult situation. And I can tell you anybody that's in this business uh, is all adrenaline 24-7. Uh, the, the time that, that people feel the need for such support is usually during recovery time is when the event goes away and the adrenaline subsides uh, and people feel spent uh, and emotionally drained. And, and usually uh, during this time uh, is, is when we need that tremendous support. Now, in an event that's prolonged like this, we're going to need to do this a lot quicker. And within the organization, we're working with, uh, with the Cambridge Health Alliance. We're working with our psychiatry department and with our mindfulness department and uh, with a lot of work that we've done uh, with, uh, with um, uh, uh, supporting our staff, supporting the community, and mostly our staff these days, including first responders in the city and towns that we serve, uh, to make sure that we have access uh, in time uh, uh, and 24-7 available. You know, obviously, all this work is done vir virtual, and uh, we will be tested to make sure that virtual support is as well as face-to-face. -face. Historically, all that's done with face-to-face, -face, and we all know the value of having somebody looking you in the eye face-to-face -face and getting that emotional support. But we're going to do our best uh, in, in this uh, during this time. And we're making sure that uh, not only we're paying attention to physical health, but also we're paying attention to a lot of psychological and mental health for our for our staff because not only they're stressed at work, but they're also stressed at home. Uh, while doing this work, their their mind is also with their families, with their kids, with their spouses. Make sure that they're safe, and also making sure that they're not bringing something back home from work. Uh, so these are difficult times across the board. Uh, and and uh, before we end, I just want to send a salute to, to our folks. So I'll get that opportunity downstream. Thank you. Um, Donna, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, I would just briefly add that I uh, agree with doc, Dr. Sass that we are talking about something that's going to um, arise for people as we're in the recovery mode. There are a group of us who are working on developing uh, both a network of information that people can access readily and uh, physicians and clinicians who are willing to provide treatment to individuals who are first responders who've not had been in care before or had a professional relationship established before. And there will be more coming from, on that shortly. Thank you, Donna. Commissioner Bard? So for us, officer safety and wellness is something that we pay um, critical attention to at, at all times. We have a robust uh, resiliency program with the department. Um, so um, we keep our finger on the pulse of morale. By all accounts, our officers are rising above these challenging times. Um, it's a tough environment, but they um, they are there to support each other. And, um, you know, I applaud their selfless efforts. So, but for us, officer safety and wellness is something that we can't lose focus on. If you uh, recall or paying attention to the news in 2019, first responders were plagued, particularly police officers, with a, a rash of suicides. So officer safety is and well-being and mental well-being is something that we, um, you know, 
make a core part of our function and we, we pay the utmost attention to uh, our, the mental health of our officers. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, before we wrap this up, I would ask uh, Monica or Kelly, is there anything else that you wanna make sure people are hearing from you? Um, this is Kelly. Just want to say thank you for this opportunity. Um, and we know that there are far too many people across Massachusetts who don't have a safe place to go to, so they can't stay at home. And so as a community, as a state, if we can do all that we can to make sure that resources are brought online quickly and immediately so that people can have safe places to stay, even if it's not their own home at this time, um, join in with the advocacy efforts to put pressure um, on the state and the federal government to make sure that these resources are brought to scale and made available swiftly. Thank you. Monica. Yes, I'd just like to also add my gratitude and let people know that legal services around the whole state stands ready to help individuals. As I said, um, we're posting information daily on uh, masslegalhelp.org. We're coming up with new ways to virtually assist uh, clients as much as possible. And we really appreciate being on the same team as Representative Decker and so many other fine people at the State House who are looking for solutions as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna, we have just a couple of minutes left, but if uh, any of you three other panelists, if there's anything else that you wanted to add to this before I give my thank you remarks here. Yeah, I'd like to say a couple of words. First to acknowledge uh, all the work that everybody's doing on this panel and particularly um, uh, Representative Decker, your energy and your advocacy and your passion to support everybody. Uh, so I wanna thank you personally. And um, I, I'd like to send a salute to all essential personnel particularly the first responders and healthcare personnel and acknowledge their remarkable courage, their resolve and their commitment to show up for work despite the real crisis and the real risk to their own health. My gratitude to them all. Thank you. Commissioner Bard, anything you um, wanna say? Yeah, I also like to thank you Representative Decker for putting this panel together. And also um, I'd just like to end with if you are a victim of domestic violence or think you might be, get get word to us, call 911, text us, call our non-emergency number 617-349-9300, get word to us and we'll come get you. Donna? Well, there is so much to be grateful for as challenging as things are right now. And I just encourage people to do what they can to protect their mental health at this time, to reduce stress, to stay connected, and to see, reach out and seek help and support. It's here uh, if you need it. Thank you. I wanna thank all of you. More importantly, I wanna thank all of you for what you have been doing every day of your lives prior to uh, the coronavirus. Um, you have made it possible for people to figure out a place to turn at a time in which all of us have many incredible needs. Um, I want to thank all of our frontline workers, our public safety officials, our medical health staff, our grocery store, our cashiers, our food delivery people. Um, people are really risking their lives, and we know this because some of them are actually losing their lives in an effort to save others. So thank you for all of um, for that. For those of you who are watching and you would like to, I've been putting out updates every night that give you um, a, I think, a pretty good snapshot of what's happening here in Cambridge, but also um, an accurate snapshot of what the state government is doing to help us move through this, please feel free to either go to my website, which is, um, what is my website? Uh, I forget, it's like decker4rep.com or email me at repdecker at gmail. Um, we will put you on that website. We will also um, be airing this again. If you have not, if you don't have Facebook, you could watch this on YouTube. The CCT, CCTV has a, has been um, uh, streaming this. You can watch this on Roku, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, CCTV's YouTube. They will be replaying this. And um, again, a very special thank you to CCTV and their staff. And I want to say a heartfelt thank you to my staff who are also serving the people of Commonwealth. I'm joined today by um, my chief of staff, Akri Bambi, my legislative aide, Sarah Nordberg. I also have committee staff, um, 
Ryan Maganelli, who's part of this. I have incredible young people who are working really hard as well, all day, all night, um, to help make sure that we can provide you all of the information you need. I would encourage all of us at this time um, to continue to be kind, to be respectful, to be factual, um, and to continue to reach out. Um, help us here. We're in this together. Um, I, I believe that if there's any state um, that can do this, regardless of those of you, uh, of, of who is leading, we are a community of people that drives our leaders, and we have a history of doing that. And we have a community of advocates and activists who drive our leaders to do the right thing. And I believe that we're in the middle of doing that. Um, this is going to get sadder and harder as we move through this. Um, but we're doing everything we can. And if you think there's something more that we need to do, or you personally are experiencing something, please do not reach out to me. Or if I'm not your state rep, reach out to your state rep, but feel free to reach out to me. I think elected officials now more than ever feel the gravity and the incredible responsibility of what it means to be elected by you to serve you in this very moment in time. Um, I want to say um, at this time, this is the conclusion. I will be back. My hope is to do this once a week with you and bring um, a variety of people. I think it's really important that you are having the opportunity to ask as many questions as you possibly can and that my job is to answer those. And when I can't bring other people who can and when I don't have an answer, that means that we need to go look for an answer. And I get that from you, um, the people uh, who really are powering our community. Um, I love you all. I'm sending you a virtual hug to my panelists. I can't thank you enough. I know you have important work to do, and I'm really, my heart is full of gratitude that you took time out today to um, be here with me and to uh, the people who are watching this. Thank you. Stay safe. Yes, you too. Stay safe and be as well as you can be. Bye -bye.